Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott has been called a preacher, teacher, healer, and friend. As the pastor of First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill, he brings his vision of an inspired future mixed with honoring the past. We're happy to have him here with us today. I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott to This is Nashville. Reverend Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Khalil, for having me. Really appreciate you being here. All right, so First Baptist Capitol Hill is one, a 159 year old church. Yeah. It's got a long and exceptional history. It's the city's first independent black congregation and it was home to Nashville's first black ordained minister. It was really at the epicenter of the civil rights movement and the pastor at the time, Reverend Kelly Miller Smith Sr. was leader in the movement and the church and hosted the nonviolence resistance training that sustained the sit-ins. Those were led by the late Reverend Jim Lawson. Martin Luther King Jr. visited a number of times. Tell me this. You got to feel this historic sense, but what what makes you make, most excited about taking over this historic and venerable church? Certainly, it's future. I, I believe that um, First Baptist Church Capitol Hill has a opportunity uh, to really shape what it means to be a movement church for the future. We all know that uh, this country is at a crossroads, and we are trying to figure out um, not just who we are, but who we are becoming. Uh, And do we allow toxicity and cancer to continue, or do we aspire for the joy uh, that can be ours? And so I think that First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill, um, uh, its future is bright. Are the congregants along with you with that feeling and that hope for the future? Well, you know, that's certainly um, that's certainly to be seen. Uh, you know, people are uh, excited and encouraged as long as it's going their way. Mm. Uh, but, you know, community means uh, that there will always be uh, seasons of... Uh, uneasiness and seasons of um, reflection and seasons of wondering uh, did we did we make the, the right choice mm-hmm. and I think that's both for, for pastor and people okay now just a few months ago you were living in Los Angeles yeah. working at another historic church Macedonia Baptist in LA tell me this how long have you been in Nashville and how'd you end up here so I've been here 90 days Wow uh, okay. give, give or take um, and um, how did I end up here? Well, uh, I, I think that it was simply God. Mm. And uh, however you define God, I, I think it's up to you. Uh, but, but God certainly opened the doors. I, I f- I'd like to think that I was doing good work in Los Angeles, uh, but uh, we were trying to figure out, uh, again, who we were becoming uh, we were in the Watts section of Los Angeles, uh, nestled between, I like to call it, gated communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we found ourselves, uh, you know, post-COVID trying to determine, uh, do we uh, be historical and relevant or do we be hysterical and non-relevant? Um, and so... You know, after some signs and some handwriting on the wall, um, you know, God began to make it clear to me uh, that uh, their future would be much brighter without me Mm -hmm. than it would have been with me. Talk to me about that handwriting on the wall. Was it print? Was it cursive? Was it spray painted in graffiti? What did it look like? Man, it was a mixture. Mm. Um, It was was a mixture of handwriting, you know, print and cursive and graffiti and hieroglyphics. It was Mm. just a mixture. Uh, Nevertheless, here's what I'll tell you. Um, I 
uh, was being considered for another another congregation here in Nashville, um, and it didn't go well. I lost the vote by three, mm. um, and some colleagues introduced me to First Baptist Capitol Hill, and um, overwhelmingly, 97% of the congregation affirmed that they wanted me to be their leader. Um, and I resisted coming here uh, mm. until I began to see in a very clear fashion uh, that that God was in the details. Mm. What what was that resistance based on? Um, you know, I, I think some of it was ego and some of it was uh, the potential of, uh, you know, dealing with a narrative that I couldn't control. Um, you know, it, it's almost like one girl turns you down and, you know, you go to her friend Mm -hmm. uh, to be your date to the to the dance, mm -hmm. um, I, I I just didn't want that narrative. Uh -huh. um, but my my mentor, um, he used a car analogy to talk about uh, these two congregations, and what he said was, you know, one is a Mercedes S five eighty, he says, but the other is a Bentley Flying Spur. Hmm. Um, and as I've dug into the history of First Baptist Church Capitol Hill. Uh, I would agree that I was a much better fit for First Baptist Church Capitol Hill than I would have been for that other congregation. And not to say that that other congregation was not exceptional, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I believe that she is. Um, but uh, for who I am and for what I've been called to do, uh, I believe that I'm in the right place. Now, First Baptist Church Capitol Hill is right in the shadow of the state capitol. And it's got no, no. The state capitol is in the shadow of huh. First Baptist Church okay. Capitol Hill. Yeah, okay, I like that. Um, you know, the church has a long history of speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. Under your guidance and leadership, will the church get political? Well, I, I don't know that the church will get political. Uh, I am certainly political. I, I believe that uh, if you, you know, um, look at biblical prophets. They were all political. Um, they they had no allegiance to one or the other, uh, but they had a commitment to the people, and they had to stand up against oppressive systems, and they had to speak truth to power. Um, and and so uh, that's who I'm called to be. I'm mm -hmm. I'm called, um, you know, as as one would say, I, I'm called to pray for you and your family. Um, to be comfortable and to be comforted. Uh, but I'm also called to pray for the marginalized and the least of these uh, to have access to the same comforts that you have access to. Mm -hmm. Now, politics has changed a lot over the years, and the prominence of the black church has changed as well. What's the place of the black church in today's political landscape? Well, the black church is, always has been, and always will be, uh, the gatekeeper to the community. Um, now, you know, I, I I think that as we think about communities, right, with gentrification and with, um, you know, uh, disenfranchisement and inequities, communities have changed. Um, and so I, I, I believe that the black church still has a, a place and a space uh, to speak truth to power, not just on behalf of black people, but on behalf of all people, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, um, while black people need health care, everybody needs health care. Uh, while, um, you know, and, and we saw here in Nashville uh, that, you know, gun safety is a public health issue. While black children are being shot in communities um, across the length and breadth of this nation, we're now finding that white children are also being shot. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, they're being shot in the comforts of their communities. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, we have a responsibility uh, not to colorize the issues, but rather to speak to the issues. Um, and so I'll, I'll continue to do that. Now, Tell me this, you've been here 90 days. Do you find Nashville to be a welcoming place for you and your family? In many respects, absolutely. Uh, this, you know, I'm, I'm a Southern boy. 
Um, and so, and I went to college in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And so th- there are some comforts of being in the South. Uh, life is slower. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hospitable place. Um, but, but I'm also an outsider, uh, particularly in the African American community. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm an outsider. And um, I, I recognize that, I accept that, uh, and we'll take it for what it's worth. How, how, do you, how do you plan on weaving yourself into the fabric of the community? Well, you know, I'm, I'm like Jesus. I'm standing at the door knocking. If you let me in, I'll come in and I'll spend time with you. If not, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move on. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not an ambulance chaser. And mm-hmm. so I don't think that every issue is my issue. Every fight is not my fight. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not going to show up to every meeting, uh, and I'm certainly not going to show up uninvited. Uh, but um, I, I'll be present. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot. For that First Baptist has this historic um, presence mm-hmm. in this city, in the community. And you're brought here to, to, to lead it now. What changes would you like to make at First Baptist? I, I don't know. I think it's too soon to talk about changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, my priorities are getting to know people, um, both within the faith community and in the broader community. Um, and I certainly believe that, um, you know, the church's lights should be the first to come on and the last to go off. Um, and, and that just means that we need to really think about how we serve um, both the congregation and the community. Um, and so I'm spending a lot of time talking to people and listening to people and uh, observing the landscape. Um, I, I think that change ought to be organic. Um, I don't think that change ought to be uh, forced. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and particularly in the in the life of any church, uh, it shouldn't be forced. It should certainly be organic, uh, because when you force change in the life of the church, uh, there's going to be resistance and rejection. What do you want the primary message of First Capital to be? Well, yeah, look, hope. I, look, I, I think that we are. Uh, we're living in a divided world. Um, we have work to do. Hope and joy are two ingredients to having a sustainable change that I feel like most yeah. people would want and they're needed. What's the other ingredient? Well, I, I think love, mm. right? Loving people based upon where they are. Um, I, I think that we have we have sought to um, we've sought to love people based upon our own individual uh, metrics. And, and I think that if we just kind of get away from our uh, personal preferences and just love people just because they're people, mm-hmm. um, I think that, uh, that, that we'll see life much different. And I think that love is played out in making sure that children have enough to eat. Love is played out making sure that, um, you know, people who are suffering from cancer have access and equal access to the same kind of care that, um, you know, people in the upper middle class society have. I think that love is played out just in simple ways, holding the door for someone, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, saying thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, saying I'm sorry, uh, saying I don't know. Um, I, I think that love, joy, and hope just have the ability to change not only people but places. And, and, and we could be so much better. And I, I believe that if Nashville can get it right and if Tennessee can get it right, the rest of the nation can get it right. Okay. And it starts with First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. Well, let me, let me ask you this before we go to break. You've been preaching now for several decades. You're a veteran. What do you understand about your profession now that you didn't understand when you started? 
Well, you know, interestingly, I, I was able to see kind of the transition from, quote unquote, the old guard to the prosperity gospel to now we're shifting back to this socially and politically engaged demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I understand at the end of the day Preachers and pastors are in the people business. And you cannot lead people, you cannot save people that you're not willing to love. We're going to continue our conversation with Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott, the pastor at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. We'll learn about his early life and how the different environments he grew up in shaped his vision and his faith. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. My guest is Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott, the pastor at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. Now, before the break, we spoke about the honor and responsibility of taking the mantle at this historic institution of worship. Now let's learn a little bit more about the human and what his life journey has been like. Reverend Scott, again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Khalil. Okay, so I understand like until you were 11, you lived with your mother in Franklin, Louisiana, which is nestled between Lafayette and New Orleans. Then your mother decided to pack you up and moved to Richmond, California, in the Bay Area. Tell me what drove that decision. Well, so as I now understand it, Franklin and other parts of the South were reeling from Reaganomics. Mm. And so my mother, you know, Franklin was parish seat. Um, the economy was driven by sugarcane and cotton textiles. Uh, Fruit of the Loom was there, mm -hmm. and the cocaine epidemic had started circulating in those small towns, and so it was just a, it was just an environment of despair and hopelessness. And so one day, my mother, you know, we she had a small two bedroom home, uh, she had a car. Uh, one day, she loaded all of our clothing into a footlocker, and we boarded the Greyhound bus and took Greyhound three and a half, four days from Franklin over to, we ultimately got off the bus in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. uh, because we were just tired of being on this Greyhound bus. And so, you know, my mother just really set out on, a, on, on what she envisioned to be a better life. And life was, even in Richmond, life was tough for a while. She worked three jobs and I had classmates who were daily, if not weekly, um, you know, recounting shootings and some were victims and some had siblings who were murdered. Um, and so life, life was tough. But I think that her decision to make that move uh, really uh, has a lot to do with who I am uh, even today. I, I do want to talk about sacrifice of that decision that your mother made, but you know, someone who's taken a, almost a semi cross country trip on the on a Greyhound bus, you see a lot of things, yeah, and you meet a lot of people in different situations taking the Greyhound from one side of the country to the next. What do you recall seeing as you all took that journey? Uh, well, I mean, so, so much. I, I think in the first instance, I had never seen a person of Latino descent. Wow. And so we crossed over into Texas, into Houston, and I began to see these people speaking this language that I had never seen before. And then as we get over to El Paso and 
Uh, so just this experience of seeing people who I had never seen before. In Franklin, it was either you were uh, white or you were black. Mm-hmm. And there were some Italians in Franklin. I, I think I also saw remnants of abuse. Um, so I, I remember very clearly this woman and her children uh, getting on the bus and five or six hours later, she being dragged off of the bus by who I now understand to be her significant other. Mm. And I had never seen that before. Um, and then just kind of seeing the the geography of our country. Uh, this is a beautiful country. Um, that, that I hope in the years to come we'll do a better job at taking care of it. Does such a shocking moment as seeing a woman being dragged off the bus in a violent form, abusive form, did that stick with you as you found yourself drawn to the calling of serving the church in a spiritual manner? Yeah, in- interesting question. I, I don't know that I've ever thought about it in relationship to my calling. I think what I did think about was as I wanted to be a husband, a father, and as I've navigated the ups and downs of life, that I never wanted my experiences to draw me to a place of abuse, that I never wanted to be that kind of a man. Mm-hmm. Now. Your mother made this sacrifice, took you from Louisiana, Franklin, to Richmond. What did that teach you about making a move on faith and hope? It sounds like, to me, your mother made that move on faith, hope, and love for you. What did that teach you? Well, I think ultimately, um, at 46 years old, I've come to understand that in the moment, you may not understand what's happening, but that the sacrifices of life are not just for that moment, but for many, many moments to come. Mm. And so as an only child, as one who has had to trust God, my mother has just kind of been my primary theologian, an example for how to do ministry by faith. When did you know you wanted to enter the ministry as a life of service? So I don't know that I wanted to enter ministry. Okay. Um, Here's what I know is that the church, the physical place, became a refuge for me as I navigated the aloneness of my adolescence. So my mother would leave for work before the sun came up and she would come home and I was already asleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so instead of going to the Boys and Girls Club or to the community center, I found myself at the church. I learned how to sweep, I learned how to mop, I learned how to public speak in the church. Mm -hmm. And I think that it just kind of became this space for me to be safe, but also this space for me to learn how to be a boy child in ways that my mother couldn't teach me. Why the church and not something like the Boys and Girls Club? Because the church was just a safer space Mm -hmm. for me. Uh, I I wasn't street savvy. I didn't learn, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know some of what my peers knew. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have relationships with the neighborhood drug dealers. Um, And so, you know, when I would get on and off the bus, I learned to keep my head down. Yeah. Uh, so that I didn't have to engage some of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so the church 
allowed me to be authentic without having to compromise. Whereas I think that the Boys and Girls Club or the community center would have caused me to have to compromise Mm -hmm. and become something that either I wasn't or something that I just never wanted to be. So the church insulated you and enabled you to maintain your boyhood innocence. Yeah. Okay, so you you mentioned that you you learned how to public speak there. When did the church leaders see you at a young age in that church and made them say, you know, we got to get this kid up in front of people. We have to get him to start teaching others. Yeah, so, you know, look, there were these books, right? These, the Sunday school book or the layman book. And I would sit there in this Wednesday night setting and I would take the book home and read it. And the next week, uh, they would be discussing the lesson and raising questions, and here I am answering it. Mm-hmm. And and I, I'll never forget the look on one gentleman's face, Jimmy Stewart, uh, who was his expression and his comments were, "Oh, you you read this and you understand this." And from there, I would have opportunities to lead discussions, to teach classes. Um, And then they began to kind of take me around to what was known as district associations and state conventions. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I got my start. All right. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Ekelona. We're talking this hour with Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott about his life and his ministry. Okay, so tell me this. How can ministry serve people in 2024 and beyond? A lot has changed in our society. And people are looking for something that's inspiring yet meaningful. You you talked about it a little bit about the your, the message of hope and love and joy. Where does the church fit in to the world that people want to be live in? Yeah, well, look, be in the world but not of the world. Um, I, I think that the the church has to be intentional about meeting people where they are. There's just so much happening in the world. And there's so much competing interest and even voices. Um, And so I think that the church just has to make some decisions about how it communicates its vision, its mission, and its willingness to be available to people. And and the church should stick with biblical principles Mm -hmm. rooted in love uh, that does not infringe upon people's personal preferences. You know, I wanted to ask you about that next, like the, the concept of how people of different faiths, denominations, even spiritual practices can exhibit the principles and beliefs while dealing with each other. What is it going to take for us to kind of see each other past our, our spiritual lines or our spiritual beliefs? Humanity. Mm-hmm. Humanity, you bleed like I bleed, you hurt like I hurt. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, every person in this world was born into the world, and every person will die and leave this world. That levels the playing field. Mm. And if we could just start there, and love people beyond our own personal preferences, I think we'll, this world will be a better place. What does it mean to you to live a good Christian life? Yeah, so I, look, I think that um, that's all relative, right? Because what, what's a good Christian life to me obviously is not a good Christian life to others. So I believe that a good Christian life is to uh, feed people who are hungry, uh, to, uh, to medically care for those who are wounded, to uh, be present for those who are lonely. I believe that being pro-life shouldn't have anything to do with a woman's body but rather should have everything to do with how we care for the, that child once they're here. And so defining a good Christian life 
it's, it's very interesting. Mm. Um, and it, it is certainly, you, you won't be able to define a good Christian life by reading two Corinthians. Mm. There's no secret that the church's attendance has fallen off over the years. Why two, two things, and we'll, and we'll go to break after this. Why do you think that is, and how do you plan to change that at First Baptist? Well, listen, I, I think attendance has fallen off, but COVID did all of us a favor. Uh, because we were able to go to what is known as this hybrid church. And so church attendance is actually up Hmm. in ways that it's never been because people are now able to log in and they're able to watch virtually from, uh, from wherever they are. I like to say people are having church and mimosas at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I, I still believe in the biblical priority of the church excuse me, and the biblical priority of the church is a gathering. How we gather may look a little different, and I think that it looks different for every context. Um, I, I just, I believe that if we're going to get people back in the building, uh, then we can't waste their time, mm. right? So we don't need long announcements. We don't need someone praying for 20 minutes. We we don't need the preacher preaching for an hour and 30 minutes, and we certainly don't need him screaming at us or her screaming at us. Um, and, and so if we're managing people's time, if the atmosphere is joyful and hopeful and authentic, I think that people will come back. Uh, and I think that the priority for many people is their children. The church has to be a safe place for children. Um, and so we, we, we have to pay particular attention to that. We don't need people offending children um, in, in a multiplicity of ways. We need to be mindful of that. All right. We're going to take one last break. When we come back, we'll talk with Reverend Scott about some of his favorite ministries and learn how those lessons can be shared with all. And as always, you can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil Ekelona, and this is Nashville. My guest is Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott, the pastor at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. Now, we've talked about what growing up was like for him and how he found the calling to serve the church. Now let's learn about his favorite ministries and how he uses those lessons with the community he serves. Again, Reverend Scott, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so right before you came here, you were senior pastor at another historic church that we mentioned earlier in the show, Macedonia Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California, which that church has served Watts for more than 100 years. Yeah. 115 years. Okay, so you have this knack of going the century old, <laughs> centuries old institutions. Tell me this: What did the work at what work at Macedonia are you most proud of? Like, what legacy did you leave behind there? So we created a uh, community development corporation that was really centered around all things children, health and wellness, and economic em- empowerment. And so we we. So that, that was a young man who was making tacos, African-American making tacos in his front yard. Mm-hmm. And LAPD was harassing him because uh, there were long lines, there were cars stopping in the middle of the street uh, because everybody was going to get these tacos. No flavor or all flavor, no grease. Okay. And uh, one day someone called and said, hey, um, we really need you to help us to talk to LAPD to leave this young man alone. Well, we had just started this community development corporation. And so I called my guy and I said, Hey, I'm going over to try and mediate between LAPD and this young man come and go with me. And so Alex says to me, um, he says, look, we just got this grant to help 
budding entrepreneurs, maybe we should see about him getting a food truck. We helped this young man get a food truck. He now has a relationship with Alliance Stadium over in Vegas. Okay. He's doing some stuff over at the stadium in Inglewood. I'm really proud that I was able to help him to avoid the criminal justice system through access to capital. Mm. Right? Helping these small budding businesses that probably would never have taken off if we didn't infuse $500, $5,000, $10,000 of micro lending to just kind of help them. We have Lottie's Cornbread. We've helped her to, she packages this cornbread mix. We've helped her to market her cornbread. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful that I've been able to help people to have some sustainable income and to be, become legitimate businesses. Um, and then around health and wellness, multiple myeloma is disproportionately affecting black and brown people and is often misdiagnosed as being a bad cold or flu. And then people are discovering, no, I really had cancer and now it's too far gone. And so creating opportunities for people to, um, to, to have some awareness of, of what's happening with their health. I, I was with Dr. Hildred yesterday from mm-hmm. Meharry, mm-hmm. um, and we were talking about the, the whole vaccination rollout. I got a call one day from an organization wanting to use our church and parking lot to vaccinate their employees. And I said to him, I said, you can use our space to vaccinate your employees and the parents of the children that you're serving and residents of this community. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, we never thought about that. I said, well, this is how we're going to vaccinate people. And so we vaccinated so many people who would not have been vaccinated in the South Central Los Angeles community. I'm really proud of that work. Do you recognize any needs for a specialized ministry in the Nashville community yet, although it's only been three months? Yeah, I I think that as Nashville is growing, um, it is not growing for African-Americans. And and I think that if you are in the know in Nashville, you're in the know, but what about people who aren't? Um, And so I I think that we need to pay particular attention to college students and graduates who we want to keep here and how they are able to become a part of this boom and this growth. Um, And then I think that the mayor is doing a good job as far as I can see uh, in terms of North Nashville, but North Nashville ought to be gentrified with North Nashville residents. And so uh, black and brown people should be a part of what's happening in North Nashville. Do you see any similarities between LA and Nashville? Yeah, but it's still a little fuzzy. Okay. There's certain feels. Yeah. It's hard to put a finger on it. Look, I know I I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles and there's, there's certain vibes and energy out there that, I mean, both places are huge entertainment hubs. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. then you look past that, there are these wonderful towns and cities there with a lot to discover. Right. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Your your, your life and your work is about helping folks. When was there a time when you were challenged by someone or something or, or someone who came to you and you didn't know how you could help them? Or there was a manner where you couldn't help them. Well, listen, man, I I think COVID, Mm. um, to to watch people die helplessly or to see five and 12-year-olds who have lost their mother and father and now 
They don't have anybody. Um, to watch immigrant families um, navigate the system alone, I felt very helpless. And I questioned my existence and even the existence of our church mm. because we were helpless. And we just had to figure it out. Now, thankfully, uh, the, the, the people of Macedonia Baptist Church and Maxine Waters is a part of that congregation, uh, we were able to rally together and to really, you know, on the, on the spot figure it out, or as best as we could, mm -hmm. right? Um, but there was just a moment that we were just... We were helpless. All we had was each other. Does the fact that hope exists in situations of despair like the ones you just told us about, is that something that motivates you to do the work that you do? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, man, listen, I think that hope, um, hope will outweigh help any day. Mm. Like, that's deep. Break that down for us. Yeah, I, um, you can help someone. Right. You can show up with a bag of groceries and that helps a family of five to eat for the week. But when you show up with a bag of groceries and the information for where you got those groceries from mm. and how Mr. Jesus or Miss Roberta can get into a job training program, you have went from helping someone to giving them hope. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that hope will outpace help any day. When you, I, I'm interested in your approach to writing sermons. Ah. Um, week after week, it's a lot. Do you ever have trouble? Finding inspiration? Do you ever have some form of, I guess they would call it spiritual writer's block? So, so yes and no. I, I think, so listen, I, I tell people often, I, I'm a real pastor. And I believe that the shepherd ought to smell like the sheep. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that if you are spending time with your people, that no, your sermon should never become... Um, you know, betraying people's trust. But your sermons should always speak to the pain points or the pressures of your congregation. And when you spend time with people, you kind of know where they are. And they don't even have to mention it to you. Mm -hmm. that, that comes from spending time with people and spending time in prayer. Um, I think, you know, my approach most often to the preaching moment is based upon series. So I just finished preaching through the 23rd number of the psalm. I took a verse a week. That was six weeks of preaching. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm also, I, as Gardner Taylor would say, I have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in another. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I do think that people find hope by connecting what's happening in the world around them uh, to uh, the clear expressions of what the Word of God says. Um, and so there are times that, I, that I'm tired and that I'm burned out and that I just need a break in order to renew my mind. Uh, and thankfully, I have friends and I have staff members who can step in and kind of give me that break, uh, and then I can get back at it. Uh, but I, but I also think that you know my humanity um, kicks in at times where uh, I too get discouraged and I too get depressed. Mm. Um, but then here comes hope again. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot. You, you talked about having the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other to stay abreast of the issues and the things that people, particularly your congregants, are really concerned with. A lot going on in the world. People are under pressure. They're upset. 
I feel mostly people are confused mm -hmm. about what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. And that creates worry, which is the opposite of hope. How can people form a stronger connection to spirit to give them peace as we go through what some may call tumultuous times? Yeah, so uh, that's probably a sermon. Right? <laughs> I, I probably need to deal with this in sermon. Well, form. this will be recorded in podcast form. But but listen, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we we are dealing with spirituality. We're we're dealing with principalities and wickedness in high places. I, I think that uh, people should spend a lot more time outside, mm. enjoy green spaces less time on social media and in front of the television and um, a lot more person-to-person -person interaction. I think that that could be really, really helpful uh, as we're dealing with these tumultuous times. A couple questions left for you. Yeah. What do you want the f congregation of First Baptist Capitol Hill to be like a decade from now? We'll project into the future. Yeah. So, uh, so here is, uh, let me back into that by saying that First Baptist Church uh, is knocking on 160 years, um, and we have to make some decisions about how we move into the future. Mm -hmm. And we've been slow about doing that because we're trying to maintain the uh, integrity of the place. We want to be historical and not hysterical at the same time. I think hysterical says that we have not kept up with uh, technology. Hysterical says that we are still expecting people to show up to a place that is 20 years ahead in terms of the date but 20 years behind in terms of progress. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I, I want First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill, to be a place where people remember our impact on society, but where people experience our willingness to move into the future and to create what the future could really look like. Last question for you. you got about a minute and a half. You lived and served in different parts of the country. What have you learned about our fellow Americans through your work and service? I, I've learned that, that people want to be cared for. I'll conclude. Dr. Amos C. Brown, who um, gave the concluding prayer last night, uh, was one of my mentors. I worked for him at the Third Baptist Church, uh, San Francisco. Um, and and he, used to, he used to say that on Sundays, people are like uh, these children and this old English painter. The painter would be down by the riverside painting and children would go and throw rocks at him and they would yell out, sir, I bet you can't paint us into that portrait. And they would do that week after week until one day they went and they discovered that the painting was there but the man wasn't. And as they went down to investigate uh, the painting closer, they discovered that he had painted them into that portrait. And every week, people are coming to church with problems, with hurts, with hopes, with dashed dreams. And they're saying, I bet you can't paint us into that portrait. And we have a responsibility to make the Word of God, the worship space, applicable to their lives. Paint them into the portrait. Reverend Dr. Shane B. Scott is the pastor at First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill. I want to thank him for being with us today. Thank you, Reverend Scott. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And welcome to Nashville. Thank you.
Thank you. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Mary Mancini. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram. Tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also leave us a message at 615-751-2500. We may use that message on air. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody, and be good to each other.